Okay, good morning. Let me welcome you to uh, Grand Rounds at UCLA. This is a special Grand Rounds that's sort of celebrating the work uh, life of uh, Robert Liberman, who uh, sadly passed away this past summer. I'd also like to welcome the family and friends of uh, Bob Liberman who are, who are joining us uh, this, this morning. Um, we're gonna have uh, two talks. The first will be by uh, Alex Kapelowitz and, and the second by myself. Uh, I think most people in the department know Alex Kapelowitz. He's a, a professor and a vice chair of the department. He's the chief of psychiatry over at the Olive View Medical Center. And he's also the medical director of the San Fernando Mental Health Center. Um, Alex worked very closely with uh, Bob during much of his life and a lot of their writings on recovery and the focus on recovery uh, were really collaborations between uh, Bob and Alex. So I think it's uh, particularly appropriate that he start this off. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good morning and thank you all for being here. It's an honor, a privilege and an absolute joy to kick off this two-day celebration of the pioneering work and enduring legacy of the career of Dr. Robert Liberman. In my brief present, oh, before I do anything else, I'm supposed to say no disclosures, okay. Um, in my brief presentation this morning, I hope to provide you with the historical context of Dr. Liberman's accomplishments and describe how he contributed to a fundamental shift in the assessment and treatment of people with severe and persistent mental illnesses that profoundly impacts our work to this day. Through his tireless efforts as an exceptional clinician, prolific academic, visionary thinker, committed mentor to many of us participating in today's grand rounds and tomorrow's symposium, dedicated advocate for the rights and needs of patients and their families, and unparalleled world traveler, and I'm sure the family knows that, unparalleled world traveler driven by his self-imposed mission to disseminate the evidence nationally and internationally for the approach that has come to be known as psychiatric rehabilitation. Dr. Liberman contributed in innumerable ways and perhaps more than any other psychiatrist to helping individuals proceed along what he liked to call their road to recovery. Before going on, I just wanted for those of you who are joining today and don't know, we have a, the second day, the symposium tomorrow, which starts uh, tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock. Uh, it'll be live at the uh, Luskin Center, but you're also able to uh, join in by Zoom, and you just need to register at the uh, address that's below. Anything else that I should mention about that or just let people, okay, very good. All right, as with all great thought leaders, they in turn stand on the shoulders of previous giants. In Dr. Liverman's case, one of his great achievements was to apply the findings from the basic laboratories of learning theorists, such as B.F. Skinner, to the treatment of se severe mental illness. The cardinal principle that developed from the early behaviorists is the temporal relationship of behavior to the environment in which it occurs. Of course, when we're talking about human behavior rather than laboratory rats that Skinner was focused on, we mean a multimodal term that encompasses not only the signs and symptoms of psych psychiatric disorders, but also cognitive functions, emotions, and verbal and nonverbal social skills. But the ABCs of learning theory, that is the focus on the antecedents or trigger of a particular behavior, as well as the consequence or effect of a behavior, is the cornerstone for even the most complex social modeling that occurs throughout the developmental lifespan. It's a short but significant step from understanding the principles of learning theories, such as operant conditioning, to systematically using them to analyze and remediate the dysfunctional behaviors associated with severe mental disorders. From his earliest work more than 50 years ago at the clinical research unit at Camarillo State Hospital, where he led a team that for 27 years treated the most intractable patients with challenging behavioral excesses and deficits and published seminal papers on their efforts. Through his role here as the director of the NIMH funded UCLA Clinical Research Center for Schizophrenia and Psychiatric Rehabilitation for 23 years, Dr. Liberman was a guiding force in developing testing and refining a variety of symptom and functional assessment tools, as well as novel interventions, including cognitive remediation, compensatory cognitive rehabilitation approaches used to improve social and vocational skills, 
and even how to reduce public stigma towards those with severe mental illness. In this slide, I've just listed a few of Dr. Lieberman's colleagues and mentees who have benefited from the training, experience, and scientific rigor at these wellsprings of innovation and creativity. It's nice to see some of those folks are here in the audience today. Okay. While I have addressed Dr. Lieberman's influence on bringing the insights of behavioral analysis to the treatment of severe mental illness, perhaps he is best recognized for his contributions to elucidating the basic principles and practices of psychiatric rehabilitation. Although he did not coin the term, he, along with Bill Anthony, a longtime director of the Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, articulated a vision of psychiatric rehab that not only included a combination of specific modalities designed to assist in the community functioning of people with psychiatric disabilities, but represented a fundamental reconstruction of what treatment should be about. Building on the well-recognized vulnerability stress model of psychopathology, Liberman emphasized how effective treatment should be formulated, not from a medical model that sees patients as a manifestation of disease, but rather as a set of protective factors that have equal priority in fostering clinical progress and improving long-term outcomes in a variety of domains. These protective factors obviously include the judicious use of psychiatric medications, but notice that in this area, in the middle star part, that these, these um, modalities are likely to contribute to a person's well-being and quality of life. Some of these other modalities listed in this slide, such as skill building, family support, and supported employment, are the evidence-based practices that make up most of the interventions included in a numerous number, a lot of practice guidelines uh, for the schizophrenia published by like the American Psychiatric Association, the UK NICE guidelines, as well as the patient outcome research team treatment recommendations, which were published uh, by the University of Maryland every 10 years or so. And in the last one included, as you can see, quite a few of the psychiatric rehabilitation modalities championed by Dr. Liberman, including self, uh, illness management skills training, supported employment, family psychoeducation, assertive community treatment, and dual diagnosis treatment. Now, the overall goal of psychiatric rehabilitation is to assure that persons with psychiatric disability can perform those cognitive, emotional, social, intellectual, and physical skills needed to live, learn, work, and function with as few symptoms as possible in the community. The treatment methods by which this goal is achieved involve teaching persons the specific skills and providing professional and community supports to reinforce those skills. While medications are aimed at symptom control and relapse prevention, psychiatric rehabilitation techniques are primarily effective for personal, social, and vocational functioning. In the next presentation by Dr. Martyr, he will show how pharmacological and psychosocial treatments can be combined to achieve optimal rehabilitation outcomes. However, because time does not permit me to describe each of these different treatments, I'd like to elaborate on just one of these modalities, social skills training, that perhaps best illustrates the impact of Dr. Liberman's work. Social skills training, like the other psychiatric rehabilitation techniques, is based on social learning principles. It emphasizes the role of behavioral rehearsal in skill development and requires that complex social repertoires be broken down into discrete steps. The primary modality is role play so that participants can both cognitively and physically learn the requisite skills. Dr. Liberman organized his approach to social skills training into curricula with discrete areas of interest designed to account for the level of functional skills that the individual currently demonstrates and uses, the individual's personal goals, the opportunities, resources, and supports available to sustain new skills in the person's social environment and the phase of the illness. These curricula, called the UCLA Social and Independent Living Skills Modules, but more commonly known as the Liberman modules, have been packaged in an easy to use format that is ideal for dissemination. In this slide, you can see that some of the relevant domains covered are not focused on the illness per se. These include how to engage in basic conversation, enhancing opportunities for recreation and leisure, developing friendship and intimacy and establishing intimate relationships and navigating the challenges of a workplace. On the next slide, 
I list the modules that are designed to teach illness self-management skills, broken down into medication management, symptom management, and community re-entry after a psychiatric hospitalization. Each of these modules are divided into sections that address specific skill areas. For example, the medication management module targets the following skills, how to obtain information about antipsychotic medications to understand their benefits, knowing the correct self-administration of medication, understanding and coping with the side effects of medication, negotiating medication issues with healthcare providers, and understanding the benefits of long-acting injectable medications. Each skill area is covered using a set of learning activities that include video demonstrations of the skill to be learned, role play activities, and problem solving to overcome the inevitable obstacles that occur when the skills are used in real world settings. Now, this is what it looks like in action. You can tell these slides are pretty old and I bet you somebody probably recognizes that woman running the uh, TV, but that's Mary Jane Robertson. For those of you who remember way back when doing this stuff. I know Michael's nodding, right? There you go. <laughs> so, in this slide, Mary Jane is demonstrating the skills using a video while the participants watch. In the next slide, you see participants in a role play in which one is the patient asking about medication side effects and the other is a healthcare provider or playing the role of a healthcare provider answering the questions. Notice that the poster on the wall, I'm not sure how easy it's to read, probably not that easy, but the poster on the wall that Dr. Lieberman created lists some of the paraverbal behaviors that can increase the effectiveness of the communication. It's not just the material, it's learning how to use them so that you can generalize them into real world skills. Finally, it really wouldn't be a complete talk about Dr. Lieberman unless I didn't include an image of Dr. Lieberman himself uh, running a group. And, and, and really, what I really like about this slide is that it demonstrates the hands-on approach to skills training. Dr. Lieberman used to say, you don't run groups by sitting on your butt. You get up and you have to demonstrate those particular skills. And here he is coaching a participant on how to make an appointment with a healthcare provider, a real world kind of a problem so that they can discuss medication side effects. So the evidence base for social skills training is very well established and has been described on numerous meta-analyses and systematic reviews. As just one example, we published 20 years ago, I was telling Dr. Martyr about this, Dr. Heinsen, who was one of the leaders at NIMH, was one of the authors on this paper. Um, that, that result that we're showing here has been replicated numerous times over the years. And skills training and schizophrenia not only leads to the improvements mentioned here in social skills, but the generalizability of the skills into natural environments and over time. It's been shown to reduce relapse rates and improve community function and has been utilized over and over in different settings. I like to use this slide as well just to demonstrate the dissemination of these uh, skills training modules, but most of you may be familiar with the fact that these modules have been translated over 20 languages, uh, well validated in multiple settings, and as you can see from this map, disseminated around the world. Over the past few years, I've become the custodian of these Liberman modules, so I can attest to the ongoing interest in these materials as I regularly receive inquiries from around the world about purchasing them. Just last week, a nurse from India uh, sent me an email asking for the community reentry module. Yeah, so I mean, it really is something that people really are fascinated by and learn from and continue to learn from. It seems that the step-by-step, -step, highly structured and prescribed package that Dr. Liberman designed allows a wide variety of practitioners from different settings and with a range of training and experience to successfully employ the program. Okay. Now, informed by long-term, I'm gonna just kind of shift gears a little bit about from social skills training, the next step, I think, in the evolution of Dr. Liverman's insights into the work with uh, schizophrenia specifically and in general, serious and persistent mental disorders. Informed by long-term follow-up studies of schizophrenia published in the 1970s and 80s from diverse areas, including Vermont, Switzerland, and Japan, Germany, they all demonstrated that recovery from schizophrenia was feasible and not that uncommon. Liberman actually wrote in one of his uh, handbooks of uh, psychiatric rehabilitation back in 1988, quote, the purpose of psychiatric rehabilitation is to promote the recovery of social and instrumental role functioning to the fullest extent possible, end quote. For Dr. Liberman, psychiatric rehabilitation was the road to recovery. 
His rationale was that if people with serious mental illness can learn the requisite skills in measurable ways using evidence-based practices, they can improve their social and instrumental functioning. In turn, focusing on functioning can lead to recovery because work and interpersonal relations are themselves therapeutic if they create environments that positively reinforce pro-recovery behaviors. It is that spirit which informs his emphasis on an individual's protective factors, gives a central place to the personalized goals and self-determination of the person living with severe mental illness, and perhaps most crucially, recognizes the importance of cultivating persistent, mutually respectful relationships with patients and their families. To facilitate research on recovery, Dr. Liberman realized that a clear target was needed. The way he expressed it was, we have a map, that's psychiatric rehabilitation, but we need a destination. After reviewing the published literature at that time, we realized that there was no consensus on how to define recovery from schizophrenia. So he developed an operational definition of recovery from schizophrenia that included symptom remission, full or part-time involvement in work or school, independent living without supervision by family or surrogate caregivers, not fully dependent on financial support from disability insurance, and having friends with whom activities are shared on a regular basis. To satisfy the definition of recovery from the long-term illness of schizophrenia, each of the above criteria should be sustained for at least two consecutive years. For validation, these criteria were submitted to focus groups that I conducted at San Fernando Mental Health Center and a variety of places in the community. And we comprised, it comprised individuals with lived experience of schizophrenia, family members, practitioners, and even researchers. The focus groups endorsed most of the criteria as being relevant to the construct of recovery, although probably not surprisingly, there were differences between the research investigators and everybody else. You know, that's just the way we are. Uh, I think Dr. Liverman would be gratified. I just looked this up on uh, a Google Scholar um, to know that the operational definitions that we published 20 years ago have been cited over a thousand times and rigorous research on recovery has increased exponentially over the intervening period. So the last slide I wanna show, and I know it's a busy slide, but I just can't avoid showing because this is probably Dr. Lippmann's favorite slide. And I stole it from him, so just so you know. Um, I'm using it because I think it beautifully encapsulates who Dr. Lippmann was as a psychiatrist, but also how he motivated those around him to provide the best possible care for those suffering from the ravages of severe mental illness. Speaking for myself, I can tell you that the Liberman 10 Cs, and that's the comprehensive care that's embedded in functional assessment, connected with the phase and type of illness, compatible with the patient's culture and individualized needs, consistent with the patient's personally relevant goals, collaborative with the informed active participation of patients and families in shared decision-making, continuous for as long as the person lives and needs the services, coordinated with all service providers and social supports, cooperative with community agencies, and competency-based, crucially important, with fidelity to the techniques of evidence-based practices, and of course, both compassionate and consumer-oriented. Given those Cs, they have been a guiding light for my work as a medical director of a community mental health center and chief of psychiatry for a county hospital. I have Dr. Lipman to thank, not just for his support and mentorship throughout my research career, but his example and encouragement for my administrative and clinical career as well. I'm gonna stop here and uh, introduce Dr. Martyr so he can do his presentation. Sludge, all right. Let me, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Martyr. He's the Daniel Friedman Professor of Psychiatry, Vice Chair for Education and Director of the Section on Psychosis at the UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. He's also the director of the Vision 22 Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, the MIREC, for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Dr. Martyr's research is focused on improving the lives of individuals with psychotic disorders, particularly schizophrenia. His research, supported by the VA, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and the National Institute of Mental Health, has focused on the development of pharmacological, psychosocial, and rehabilitation approaches for improving the functioning and quality of life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martyr. Alex, thanks very much. Um, I do have disclosures. What I would like to do is to 
show the uh, influence of uh, Bob Liberman on uh, research at uh, UCLA over the decades. It's the legacy of a, uh, somebody who does research and particularly somebody who brings researchers together isn't just the papers and the books that they write. It's really the people that they train. And uh, I think what you'll see is that uh, Bob Liberman, whose nature was to bring people together and to, uh, to try to influence the direction that they're, they're taking, that uh, he has an enduring legacy uh, uh, that I, I'd like to describe to you. Um, to start off, uh, I think one has to go by what Alex just said about recovery. Uh, back in the uh, 1980s, some of us uh, learned about recovery uh, from Bob Liberman and from other sources. And we began to realize that much of the work that we were doing really wasn't focused on, uh, it was focused on reducing symptoms of, of an illness like schizophrenia, but we were missing what many patients were looking for is to improve the quality of their lives, to uh, help them function more in the community. And what Bob Liberman did is he set uh, a course for a number of researchers who worked with him, which really has endured over the years. And uh, I'll talk about these people. They include Michael Green, Keith Nectarline, uh, Joseph Ventura, Shirley Glynn, uh, our interim chairman, uh, Alex Young, and you know, Luana Turner and, and other people who've been influenced in their life's work by Bob Liberman. I'm going to talk about some of his work, but I'm also going to talk as well about uh, the work that's still going on and in the future that's focused on unimproving functioning. Um, and to, to give you the con some, some context from my vantage point, uh, back in the uh, 1980s and early 1990s, uh, my research was focused on psychopharmacology. I was going to, I worked on how to uh, reduce the side effects of antipsychotics, how to keep people safe. I, my, it was totally focused on symptoms. You know, Bob convinced me that I should do more. Uh, I think most of the people here knew Bob. He was uh, exuberant at times. He was uh, controlling at many times. Uh, at times, uh, he was so enthusiastic about uh, social skills training that it sort of could get on your nerves at times. And uh, so I decided to, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I, not what I did, but to design into some of our studies uh, what he did, maybe to prove that uh, he was wasting his time. So uh, back in the early 90s with an NIMH grant, we studied uh, social skills training and group psychotherapy. We compared them. Uh, Shirley Glynn and Ted Ekman were major parts of that study. And uh, but the pharmacotherapy component uh, was putting people on a low dose of a long-acting antipsychotic, flufenazine, uh, uh, enhancing treatment when they developed prodromal symptoms. But we also added group therapy and uh, social skills training. And uh, Bob was right that uh, what happened was that uh, drugs were fixed symptoms they didn't affect uh, social behaviors. His social skills training actually did, and patients showed improvement. Uh, and this sort of set off my career, which was the idea that, uh, that drugs have a context and that uh, patients are asking much more from treatment than just you know, relieving their suspiciousness and hallucinations. We uh, did another study where we, uh, supplemented uh, the skills training by sending the skills trainers with the patients out into the community 
it was an almost impossible study to do. And I remember we invented something called IVAST, in vivo assisted its skills training, uh, and we compared it. And, and, and at the time, we had new antipsychotics. Uh, risperidone had come out, so we compared a new antipsychotic to an old one. And interestingly, although we thought these new antipsychotics were really going to change things, uh, they had similar effects on, on social functioning. It was the enhanced skills training that made the difference. And, and again, this made uh, changed my career and, and, and changed the director of research, not just by myself, but uh, by our research group. And what we began to develop, and I think that I'm, I'm gonna talk about two large research groups, one of them, Keith Nectarlines and the aftercare group, and uh, the group uh, that's on the other side of the freeway, uh, at least it was at that time with uh, Michael Green and myself, uh, we began developing a, a strategy for improving functioning, for really following the inspirational work of uh, Bob Liberman. Um, and so we developed pathways for improving functioning. And, and this is a, a, one of many such slides uh, developed by Michael Green in a, in a publication where we began looking at what the determinants were of uh, community functioning. Uh, they were, um, we focused mostly on cognition, but not just the kind of co cognition that uh, memory and attention and the executive function, but on social cognition. And, and Michael Green, I think, became an international leader in the world of defining uh, how the social brain works, uh, how we uh, assess faces and emotions in others, and how we can kind of put ourselves at another person's uh, perspective and, and see how they see the world. So we began looking at social cognition and non-social cognition, which were uh, really very important in determining functioning. We looked at motivation and beliefs and developed strategies, not just in, in order for research to move ahead in functioning, one just didn't have to establish a goal of improving uh, social cognition and cognition and uh, motivation. One has to measure them and has to find, develop measurements that could be used in clinical trials. Um, uh, Michael, Keith and I played a major role in uh, an NIMH um, uh, initiative during the, uh, 19, uh, during the early 2000s called Matrix, where we actually defined how clinical trials should measure cognition. Because Michael Green had found back in the 90s that uh, cognition was, uh, was more associated with functioning than were hallucinations. And this is a finding which goes back in the schizophrenia literature for many years that uh, uh, symptoms may determine whether somebody gets hospitalized and whether they can live in the community, but it really doesn't affect whether they can work and return to school and, function in family life. In order to improve those, we really need to look at uh, cognitive functions and we'll talk about social cognition. So we, we developed a strategy. If one goes to clinicaltrials.gov where trials are registered, you'll find 30 or 40 studies that actually use the tools that uh, we developed. And it actually led the pharmaceutical industry to become interested in, de in developing the tools both psychosocial treatments like uh, cognitive remediation, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, and uh, drugs to improve cognition. I chaired an NIMH negative symptom consensus. Negative symptoms are the kind of apathy and uh, uh, lack of sort of drive that uh, is often associated with schizophrenia that has a major role in people being able to return to work or to being re rehabilitated. Uh, 
And within our group, we uh, developed uh, an instrument for developing negative symptoms called, called the CANES, the Clinical Assessment Interview for Negative Symptoms. We set up collaborations, which have actually studied it. We looked at measures of social cognition uh, and uh, again, took leadership in that area. And we also looked more at the brain because research during the uh, early 2000s began to focus uh, on how we can actually af affect the brain. And it's interesting, if you look at the past 40 years of research that uh, we've done, but starting with Bob Liverman, you could really see the trajectory of uh, intervention re research in, in psychosis. Um, the uh, tool that uh, was developed, and this is the manual uh, that was authored by uh, uh, Keith Nectarline and Michael Green, actually uh, is the consensus battery, which is the gold standard that people use to measure cognition. Uh, it's been translated into, I don't know how many languages, uh, 20 to 30, what? 30. 30. It's been translated into 30 languages uh, and uh, we actually had to form a nonprofit corporation, which took a lot of work, not, not by me, but by Keith and Michael, uh, to, in, in order to actually uh, put this in a box uh, and actually disseminate it really around the world. And it's still the gold standard instrument. So I've spoken about how we sort of moved the field towards recovery, towards sort of Bob Liberman's um, sort of vision of, of improving functioning. Uh, let's focus on actual research that takes place. And I'd uh, like to start with the UCLA aftercare program, uh, which is ju just across the street, uh, which has focused on uh, managing patients uh, in, a, in a first episode. And just to give you an example, of their current uh, work, well, well their, their, their recent work. Um, one of, uh, you know, again, uh, the influence of Bob Liberman that returning to work and school should really be the direction of research. Uh, Bob, uh, Joseph Ventura was reminding me of the day that, that how Bob loved to bring people together. And he brought uh, both of our groups, uh, together with Robert Drake and uh, Deborah Becker from uh, New Hampshire, Dartmouth in New Hampshire, in order to look at this promising method of uh, getting uh, people with disabilities, uh, psychiatric disabilities, back to, uh, back to a working in environment. And it's uh, uh, an approach called individual placement and support. Uh, it uh, associated getting people right into a workplace, not into, uh, it gets them out of, uh, you know, long-term uh, rehabilitation, you know, the, the kind of rehabilitation that's done at the county level, which actually doesn't work very well, uh, and, and getting them into their communities. Many of us learned that it's, if you tell someone in a job that they did a good job, it's much better reinforcement than you could get from a psychiatrist telling you that you're doing well. Um, so, uh, and, and actually with uh, Luana Turner, they uh, modified this kind of work approach to actually include education. And uh, this is from uh, a recent publication, which found re remarkably, I'm sorry, that yellow line is a little bit light, uh, that 92% of the patients who received both uh, this individual placement and support along with the workplace fundamentals module, which is part of Bob's social skills training, uh, were actually uh, by 18 months were uh, either working or back at school. And th this was a remarkable uh, accomplishment. And again, this was compared with traditional vocational re rehabilitation. I remember Robert Drake telling me that the longer one spends in uh, traditional vocational rehabilitation, the less likely they are to actually work. Uh, whereas the, this, this new approach was effective. Um, 
this idea of combining drugs with uh, drug strategies, with psychosocial strategies, is something that um, the aftercare group, you know, with Keith's leadership has sustained. Uh, this was a study in which they looked at a long acting uh, medication, this long acting risperidone versus uh, oral medication. And uh, it's after a first episode, and they looked at uh, they looked at, at cognitive remediation. They found that cognitive remediation, this is a computer-based strategy for helping patients to, to, to improve their cognition. Uh, it was superior to the control condition, but uh, the effects were only manifest when uh, medications were assured by a long-acting uh, antipsychotic. Uh, and that both the long-acting medication and cognitive remediation uh, led to uh, improvements in work and in school functioning. Uh, again, uh, this uh, focus on, on functioning. More recently, this group has looked at uh, exercise, uh, which uh, this is from a study, and this brings in um, uh, Joseph Manchura, Sarah McEwen, and, and others in Keith's group, looked at uh, global functioning in people who received uh, both cognitive training plus an exercise re regimen compared to, to, to cognitive training. And you could see by the dark line that, uh, that cognitive training actually, uh, that, I'm sorry, that exercise actually enhances cognitive training. Uh, this finding has been supported by others throughout the world that exercise really is good for the brain. It doesn't just you know, affect uh, cardiovascular health. And Bob Kern from our group has also done a study which found that uh, aerobic exercise. Re recently, if you, a couple of years ago, when you walked around the VA grounds, you'd find Bob Kern you know, walking with this a group of uh, veterans uh, and it actually improved their global functioning. This is uh, again the group that uh, I'll call the MIREC and the and, and, and the Green Lab. It's very large. It sort of makes me sad that uh, many of the young psychiatrists and psychologists never got to know Bob Liverman uh, and don't really know that much of the work that we do. Uh, is actually um, derived from the sort of direction that uh, Bob sent us in. Um, I'm going to talk particularly about uh, work that I've done uh, with you know, Michael Green and Bill Horan and others that's uh, focused on um, improving social cognition, particularly higher order social cognition. So, uh, this is Bill Horan, who, who was in our group until recently. And he found that uh, we developed uh, social cognition training. Again, we're developing these uh, new, new treatments. And he found that it worked very well at uh, helping patients at a very, uh, I, don't, I don't wanna say simple level, but being able to uh, interpret gestures and facial expressions that we could actually improve that by, uh, by a training group-based intervention. But what we couldn't do, or at least this wasn't effective at, was uh, improving higher order skills, being mentalizing skills, being able to put yourself in somebody's uh, shoes uh, and, and being able to empathize with another person. This is, uh, as you can imagine, can be uh, re really limit uh, the, the improvement that patients can experience. So we asked whether a drug could facilitate this training. And, and we turned to uh, oxytocin, which is a, a neuropeptide, uh, which you actually have to take through a nasal spray. Uh, and oxytocin increases the salience of social information. Uh, when you take the nasal spray, uh, somehow it biases your brain towards focusing on, on social rather than non-social information. So we evaluated whether or not uh, just before a training session, 
if we gave them oxytocin, would they learn these higher order skills more quickly? And I'm not gonna show you this whole slide, but just say it was a really complicated study. Uh, and, um, and, and the finding was uh, we, we developed a measure of, I shouldn't say we, Michael Green and his group developed a measure of empathic accuracy, uh, being able to sort of uh, understand what uh, someone else is feeling uh, at a particular time. And we found that giving people oxytocin right before the training session actually enhanced uh, empathic accuracy. And uh, we're following this up in uh, other studies. And we also looked at uh, using EEG and other methods uh, with uh, Eric Rivas and uh, John Wynn in our lab. We actually have uh, looked at how, uh, how a brain measure of e using EEG could actually uh, help people focus more on, um, I'm sorry, can actually measure whether or not oxytocin is working in the brain. And uh, this work is actually continuing uh, as we go. Um, I want to uh, measure that, I, I want to just mention that this work is continuing, uh, that um, Yvonne Yang, one, one of our young psychiatrists in the department is uh, looking at uh, whether or not we could use measures of inflammation or we could address inflammation with uh, drugs and measure and using both PET imaging and uh, other things in order to actually um, be more specific about which patients would benefit from treatment. We're uh, combining uh, our focus on negative symptoms. We're combining motivational interviewing, which seems to work with cognitive behavior therapy We've recently become interested in uh, psychedelics and whether psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy with drugs like uh, MDMA and psilocybin can actually uh, help patients learn more uh, uh, and sort of help them engage socially, particularly patients who are apathetic. And uh, Michael Green has actually developed, uh, we have a new VA center, which is focusing on the uh, community integration of people who've uh, recently been homeless. So we've kind of drawn this in from the patients who are psychotic with schizophrenia to the larger populations of homeless veterans. And again, you know, Bob Liberman's uh, influence is in all of this work. Um, so to summarize, uh, what I think Bob did at uh, UCLA and you know, throughout the world, through the many people he interacted with, he uh, focused intervention research on uh, recovery and functioning that uh, he, uh, that set uh, a group of researchers at UCLA uh, towards you know, a, a new goal for uh, clinical treatment research that I think has, has really flourished. Um, I, I believe that uh, Bob's work is continuing. I hope that this seminar and what we're doing tomorrow and some of our other work will let people know that this is probably the future direction of tre treatment research. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll attribute much of it to Bob Liverman. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I think right now, uh, Alex and I will uh, address any questions that people have. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions from the virtual audience. Uh, and this is for you, Alex. Uh, are, are the training modules available in the public domain? Uh, they are available, there is a cost associated with them. So they, we, people can reach out to me personally. As I said, I have the, uh, the entire inventory in a warehouse at uh, all of you. So if someone's interested in purchasing the modules, then they can get in touch with me and I can uh, arrange for that. 
Um, the, the next question comes from uh, Diana Lee Luxemburg is, I think that she's asking about uh, whether or not uh, this sort of job-based influences can, can be used across cultures. Um, did you want to answer that? <laughs> sure. That, that's been kind of the focus of my work for a long time is trying to adapt evidence-based practices for different populations. I, as I mentioned earlier, I work in the uh, San Fernando Valley in a predominantly Hispanic area. About half of the folks are uh, Latino mm -hmm. uh, and uh, half of those are monolingual Spanish first generation mm -hmm. in the United States. So we've been working with uh, some of the people you mentioned to adapt these approaches, whether it's social skills training, family psychoeducation, and even vocational rehabilitation approaches to see what needs to be adapted to utilize them in different populations. And so, yes, we published on that as well. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Michael Agris. What other conditions have been uh, studied with the use of these modules? So in terms of diagnostically, you're saying- Yeah, right, it's gone, I, I assume it's gone beyond schizophrenia. Oh, absolutely. Other, as, as I mentioned earlier, some of these are focused on th very generic issues like medication management. That's not just limited to uh, schizophrenia medications. It could include medications for bipolar disorder, depression, OCD, et cetera. So the, the skills are generalizable to a variety of different things. Same thing with symptom management. The symptoms are very generalized and can be in a variety of different areas. And then as you remember, I brought up that some of these modules are actually not illness specific. There are things like recreation for leisure, friendship and intimacy, workplace fundamentals. They are certainly used in a variety of different conditions and have been with many different illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Beth Fromm. Uh, would you speak to getting insurance to cover the psychosocial therapies, individual placement and support, work play, uh, social skills training for patients with schizophrenia in the community, not in an academic setting? Does Blue Cross care about global functioning? Uh, she says that 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 was rhetorical. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't speak to Blue Cross being a county employee. I work with a population that is mostly either indigent or Medi-Cal, at least yeah. in California. And I can tell you that Medi-Cal does cover quite a few of the psychiatric rehabilitation. Family psychoeducation is covered. Vocational re rehabilitation approaches like IPS, the one you described, yeah. is covered. So yes, absolutely, those can be covered. Whether Blue Cross does it or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah Andy, yeah. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed both of your talks. And sort of along those same lines, I wonder if you could comment on the level of severity of illness and chronicity of illness that have been studied with these interventions. And what is the what are the characteristics of the population that in which these types of interventions might be most effective? And conversely, are there somewhere they've been shown to be less effective. Yeah, I, let, me, let me take that. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the things that's always been very annoying, one of the many things that annoys me is that uh, uh, when, so, when interventions are studied by Keith's group, they work great. Uh, uh, and, and when we study them, it, it's hard to define the effects. So, so I, I think that, uh, you, know, you know, one principle is that things like support or employment and education, they uh, intervening early in the illness is really important. I should, I should have mentioned that the um, intervention that was developed uh, by, by the aftercare program, uh, you know, individual placement, it's, education and uh, work support uh, has actually been what was used in the NIMH uh, RAISE study, which was, I think, probably one of the most consequential studies of the past 15 years, I, I would say. And, and, and in that study, uh, they also found that uh, this, this was really effective. So I, I, I would say that treatments uh, by front-loading treatment early in the illness 
uh, which, which I think is what, what the aftercare program does. I think treatments seem to work better. That doesn't mean that we can't improve the lives of uh, people who've had many episodes, but I, I, I think it becomes a bit more challenging. I don't know. If yeah, let me just elaborate on the first about the raise thing that you talked about, which is a seminal study. One of the findings of that study was that the earlier you intervene after the illness begins, the more likely you'll be successful. So even within that group of early onset or you know first couple of years of the illness, the ones that had gotten the uh, the intervention. I think it was in the first 18 months after the illness showed significant improvement more so than the folks that got this enhanced uh, approach um, after they had been ill for quite some time. So that's true. The, the only thing I would, I would elaborate on that though, is you know, when I first started working with Dr. Liberman, the first thing he did is he sent me out to Camarillo State Hospital to work with the most difficult refractory patients that were in that clinical research unit. It was a great learning experience because you learned how to pay attention to details and make sure you identify the behaviors that you wanted to remediate. And all those basics I showed earlier about the ABCs and all that sort of thing, that came from there. And I see Michael nodding because he remembers his days out there as well. Um, and But those folks improved pretty significantly as well, not in the same domains that we're talking about, but in their ability to function within that hospital setting. So I think the issue is to really target the symptoms that you're looking for, the behaviors that you want to improve. And these modalities do seem to work because they use really basic behavioral principles that are extraordinarily effective. I'm sure Gary's nodding, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, a question from uh, a, a colleague of ours, Carol Spar. Uh, do you know if there's been any research using these strategies in people with uh, autistic spectrum disorder. Um, you, the, um, you know, oxytocin and uh, other uh, and psychosocial treatments have been used in uh, autism spectrum, but I can't really talk about uh, this status. I hope you can. I can't, but Gary could if he wanted to. <laughs> we have one of the world's experts on working with individuals that with autism and other developmental disabilities. Uh, Gary Lavinia, who's there, is willing to at least. You're not. You're not on today, so I don't have to. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But the work that I, I also had the privilege of being able to work with Bob, who put me in touch with Gary, who's written numerous books on behavioral uh, analysis and using it for populations that include uh, individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities. So I'm not gonna make you talk, but yes, there is a, a extraordinary literature and Gary's book itself on uh, violence, as a matter of fact, is uh, you know, well known uh, in the literature. Okay, and, and we have a, a final, oh yes, question. Yeah. Uh, could, could you wait until the microphone? I was curious if there's a push to bring social skills training or these skills training modules into homeless shelters or what challenges might exist to get them there. I think that's a great point. Um, I'm not aware of interventions that have tried that we've done work with uh, populations of uh, individuals with obviously challenges with regard to homelessness and stuff, but I'm not familiar with a specific project that targeted that population it makes a great idea. I think I have a grand idea now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And, and the final question will also go to you, Alex, because hopefully you can answer it. Uh, do you think that the psychiatric community has enough resources to support the idea of a, of a care court for the mentally ill homeless? Wow, care court. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're bringing one in. That's interesting. I don't know if most people in the audience are aware of uh, care courts, but this is a, an idea that is being um, uh, well identified by the current governor uh, of California and, and leadership there regarding how to address the issues uh, associated with people who are homeless, mm -hmm. who are severely and persistently mentally ill, and uh, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. And so there's always a, a struggle because of the issue regarding civil liberties and the need to hospitalize someone against their will. And how do you deal with that when you have folks that may not be as aware of their illness? Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty complicated topic. Do I think there's a role for skills training? Absolutely. I think the whole notion of these care courts is to help people get off the streets, not to uh, force them into treatment, but to engage them in a treatment process that can then 
you know, enhance their illness management skills and hopefully allow them to make decisions that they can, uh, that will drive them towards a, a better future. So the whole notion of the care courts is not meant to be coercive. It's meant to be really kind of uh, empowering for individuals to be able to, um, you know, achieve their goals. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Wells. Yep. I was just going to comment um, on behalf of probably most of the people here. One of the things I remember from my residency about Bob is how he combined passion, science, organizational planning, mm -hmm. uh, documentation. I mean, it, it was like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, how much can you get done from the heart mm -hmm. to really help vulnerable populations? And you've all done that, which is great. But I just think it was something back from my early training days. It was like, wow. <laughs> and it's part of what uh, prompted me to want to go into academics, which I had not planned to do when I went into training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just a comment, just a shout out to Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That probably is a great final thought. That's a, that's a great final thought. Thanks so much for attending.